there's one thing I really don't like, it's a yelling preacher. <laughs> well, if you'd like to turn open to John chapter 18, we are going to read quite a long section of Jesus' trial before Pilate, beginning in chapter 18, verse 28. As we read it, um, just listen, there's a structure here. John is really good about putting structure into his narratives. And if you watch for it, you'll find there's a structure to this passage where there's three conversations that Pilate has with the Jewish leaders and with Jesus. And then there's an intermission when Jesus is tortured by the soldiers. And there's three more scenes of Pilate having conversations with the Jewish leaders in Jesus. So beginning in 1828, then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. And now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. And they went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to the law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you really realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is called Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. The word of the Lord. Amen. And if I remember right, we're not going to have children's church today. Is that right? No, we do, Vicky. Okay. I was thinking there was a spring break. We weren't. I can't remember. Is it next week? Okay. 
So uh, follow Vicky and Val out if you've got five-year-old through fifth graders. They're welcome to go. Well, God has blessed me with some good friends. And as I was studying and preparing for the message this morning, um, I had a great resource um, that I only had access to. I'm the only one. Well, actually, there's five of us. Friends of a friend. My friend's name is Mark Smith, and he teaches classical history at the College of Idaho. And he, uh, he's one of those kind of classic historians that believe history really doesn't start unless it's 500 years ago. And so uh, we get together um, pretty regularly throughout the year to, to talk and to discuss books and, and catch up on our lives. And the beginning of this school year, he, he told us that he was writing a book about Jesus' crucifixion, about his trial and, and so forth, because he's also, beyond being just a historian, he's an archaeologist. And he takes it very seriously. He goes to Israel almost every summer and spends a month or more I'm working some of the archaeological sites in and around Jerusalem, primarily, but also out where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And so, um, so Mark has a, a very intimate knowledge of the Holy Land, as well as the Scriptures. And the book that he is in the process of finishing right now is called "The Thrill of Defeat and the Agony of or the Thrill of Defeat and the Agony of What's the reverse of that? Now I can't think of it. A victory. Exactly. Okay, he turns it around because the cross is exactly that. It's the thrill of defeat because Jesus appeared to be defeated, but it accomplished so much more than anybody could imagine. And the agony of victory was the agony that was Pilate's and the Jewish leaders when all of their plans went for naught. And Jesus didn't die an ignominious death, a, a, a death of a criminal and would soon be forgotten. That didn't ever happen. So there's both the, the, the thrill of defeat and the agony of victory. But Mark, in his book, um, has a little difference of opinion from tradition about how this trial happened. And I want to sh kind of show you a little bit of, uh, of that this morning as a hypothesis. Because as historians know, when you're looking at 2,000-year-old history, you don't have everything you need to fill in all the details about it. But, but there are some things that we know and some things that we can reasonably conjecture. And so we're going to take a, a brief look at some historical and archaeological things that can give us a background on why Pilate acts the way he does and what we might think of Pilate in his position as the Roman governor of Judea, um, of, of the Israel of that day. And so the first thing that we need to understand is, is that we know that Pilate was a real person. Pilate um, was, we know from the historian Philo and the historian Josephus, that, that Pilate served um, well over eight years as the governor of Judea. And this actually is an archaeological remnant that they found that has an inscription here that is made out to Tiberius, who was Tiberius Caesar during Pilate's reign, and it goes down and says, in honor given by Pontius Pilate. And so we know that Pontius Pilate was a real person. And we know a little bit of his political history. And one of the ways that we can understand Pilate's actions is to understand what happened in the previous seven years that he had been governor of Judea. One thing that we always know is, is that Romans despised being located in Israel, in Judea, because the Israelites were constantly seething, trying to, getting, being prepared to revolt. It was always a rebellion waiting to happen. And beyond that, the Jews had these weird religious rules and laws uh, that they tried to practice, the, the Sabbath and the feasts and the sacrifices and everything that went with that. And the Roman generals, the Romans politicians, had no clue what any of that was about. And, and so they came and, and, and they were somewhat ignorant. And Pilate was ignorant um, uh, when he first got there. And, and he 
oftentimes spent his time uh, in Caesarea, which was on the coast, uh, a few hours' journey to the, to the west of Jerusalem. But he also had a place in Jerusalem called the Praetorium that he stayed when he was in Jerusalem. Tiberius, the Caesar of, of, that appointed Pilate, was, of course, in Rome and would summer in another place in Rome. And he had a, what was called a Praetorian council, a Praetorian advisor. He was his chief of staff, and his name was Sejanus. And Sejanus um, was, was a pretty good administrator. But Tiberius, being away from Rome for a while, began to be suspicious, even paranoid that somebody was trying to overthrow him, was trying to have a palace coup. And he told Sejanus to round up his enemies list and execute them. And he did. But he became so, Tiberius became so paranoid that eventually he had Sejanus arrested and he executed him. Now the problem for Pilate was, was that Sejanus was his mentor, was his advocate. And Pilate could have been associated with Tiberius's imaginary coup, his imaginary paranoid um, sense that, that since Sejanus and Pilate were good friends, were, were, well, one was a mentor and one was his, essentially his student, that somehow Pilate would have been mixed up in this rebellion as well, in this overthrow of Caesar. And so Pilate was on shaky ground politically when Jesus came to his attention. And there are some other things that had gone on as well. Um, it helps to understand there was a thing called the affair of the shields. And this kind of gets to that Jewish preoccupation with their religion. Because in wanting to make himself in put, in, in wanting Pilate, Pilate wanting to put himself in a good light with Tiberius, had a whole bunch of shields made that were dedicated to Tiberius. And he'd Pilate had learned earliestly, you don't make any images. The image of Caesar, the Jews considered an idol, and, and they, they hated them. They wouldn't deal in coins that had the idol, had the Caesar on it, because any of that was, a, was an idol, a, a false representation of someone who claimed to be a god. And um, Pilate had learned from a previous experience not to do that. But he didn't know how far that belief extended because these shields had a, most likely an inscription similar to this on them. In honor of Tiberius, the son of God was most likely written on him. We don't know this for certain, but it's one of the conjectures that, that these shields had something that referred to the Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, as a son of God. And he'd actually put them in the praetorium, but the Jews still objected. And the Jews still didn't want anything like that in Jerusalem, in their holy city. And so Pilate, um, again, it was a toe-to-toe -to -toe thing with the Jewish leaders. And he wasn't going to back down, but the Jewish leaders, not the ones involved in this trial, but some other ones, sent a letter and a delegation to Rome to tell, them, to tell Tiberius about their objections to this. And Tiberius had sent back a letter telling Pilate, take those shields down. We don't want to incite the Jews. We don't want to cause problems. Just leave them alone. And so Pilate had had to back down. And again, his tenuous appointment as the governor of Judea was more tenuous because he looked like he couldn't handle things properly. And so that's, all that political history is in the background of how Pilate deals with Jesus. He was really in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. And everything that he had done had angered some portion of the Jewish leadership, with the exception of this family of Annas the high priest. And one of the things apparently that Pilate realized over these seven years is that whenever he didn't consult with Annas the high priest or the, or the priest that had been appointed by Annas, things went badly. And so he had learned that he needed to be in a political um, partnership with a high priestly family. And that if he did, that, that they would smooth over things, that, that there was an exchange, peace and stability for him and the Jewish high priest's power and control and wealth for that family. And so it was a political partnership. 
That's Pilate, but what about the place of the trial? And this is where it gets a little bit tricky and a little bit conjectural, but it makes a lot of sense to me. Oops, I've got to turn this on if I'm going to work. Okay, let's try that. Still not working. Can you advance at one, Sean, for me? This is a picture of the area 2,000 years later from where Jesus was um, tried. And it's, it's just to give you a picture of what happened. A lot of the walls, of course, have been t- torn down. Um, the pavement that, that John speaks of has been removed probably a few hundred years ago by the Ottoman Empire. And things look much different. But this just kind of is to give you a sense of, um, of what it was like. There were, you know, multi-level places with stairs and steps um, in and around leading to different doors um, in the wall. And what my friend Mark conjectures is the pictures you might have seen of Jesus' trial probably don't line up with reality because if you've seen things like Jesus of Nazareth or the Jesus movie um, or or even the Passion of the Christ, most oftentimes, or I should probably say most every time, Jesus is pictured of, of, of being next to Pilate at the end of the trial, standing up there in crowds and crowds of Jews Tens of thousands of the hundred thousand that would come to the Passover feast were there shouting to crucify Jesus. But one thing archaeologists discovered is that there was something called the Essene Gate or the Hidden Gate that was in a wall that connected the Praetorium where Pilate was with the inside of this area. And I'm not sure it's pictured the wall because it's not there anymore. But there was a place to go directly from Pilate's palace, the praetorium, to the courtyard that was next to the temple. And so this is the scheme that that he believes was the scene of the trial of Jesus. These things that I read of Pilate going back and forth from the crowd to Jesus happened here. See if I can reach it. It said early, early, early in that narrative that the Jews did not want to go into the praetorium because they would become unclean. Because if you entered a place, uh, a Gentile place, before the feast of Passover, you would become unclean and you couldn't celebrate it. So, I need something longer, but it's not going to work. This wall right here that runs this way, the, pra- the praetorium is on that side of it, to the north, above it. This hidden stairway, this hidden gate right here, would lead into the praetorium, but would lead out to where the Jews could go in this courtyard. And the chances are that as, as Pilate goes back and forth from those crowds to Jesus, all he's doing is taking a couple steps back to talk to Jesus, as if Jesus is right here behind him, and maybe even visible to some of the people in the crowd who were essentially in this courtyard area. And probably overflowing. Maybe this gate was closed. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe they were down these stairs. This is actually a rock outcropping. And there's some more space here. But it's a very small area. And so the conjecture is, is that we can, if you picture it this way, the crowd is not a crowd of tens of thousands. It's a crowd probably of 20 or 30. Enough people to fit in this area. And that Pilate would have been up and down these stairs and the Jews would not have gone in. And that was the way it could happen so quickly because one of the historical complaints is is that Jesus' trial would have taken way too long if they had to go back and forth from the praetorium out to the other side of the courtyard and back and forth. And Caiaphas' house probably was only a couple of blocks from here. So so it gives us the the possibility or probability that that this could have happened in a very short time frame. And who would have these people have been that were in this courtyard clamoring for Jesus' crucifixion? Well, as we talked about last week, they were probably the high priest Annas' extended family. Because again, he was the wealthiest, probably the wealthiest person in Jerusalem. For years, he had been the high priest or appointed his sons and sons-in-laws to the high priesthood. But he also appointed other priests and they were almost always family members. And so, the chances are there was a crowd of about 20 or 30 standing around in here as Pilate comes up and down, as Jesus is behind him, 
And, and it's a very small, contained trial, in essence. Not this big public production. Most of the Jews in Jerusalem at the time probably didn't even know what was going on and wouldn't have known until Jesus starts carrying his cross to the place of the skull, Golgotha. So keep that in mind as, as we look at this passage because it's not so far-fetched to, to think that this was the place where Jesus was. This was where Pilate was having these six conversations Four with the Jewish leaders, two with Jesus. And it was just a matter of turning and having Jesus come forward or taking a couple steps towards Jesus. It seems to make a whole lot of sense. We don't have time this morning to go through all the details of what we read. I want to focus on those two conversations that Pilate had with Jesus. The first one is found in verses 33 through 37. We read them. But they were a good reminder that being a politician in any day and age is a difficult thing. Because as I described, Pilate was between a rock and a hard place. It's evident that Pilate knew Jesus was not guilty. He didn't look like a king. He, he didn't have any of that regal bearing, in a sense, that a king would have. He didn't see him as a threat to Caesar or to himself. And if you look at the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you look at John, seven times Pilate wants to release him or declares him not guilty or tries to hand him over and get him off the hook. Seven times Pilate um, wants Jesus to be released. And every time the Jews made it more difficult for him to do that. And so... In this first conversation, we see that being played out. Because Pilate wants to know if Jesus really is a king. And I don't think Jesus is playing a cat and mouse game as, as much as he's trying to get Pilate to get to the point where he will understand the truth. When Jesus responds in verse 34, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? We don't know how much Pilate knew about Jesus before the Jewish leadership brought Jesus to him. He may have been totally ignorant. He may have heard rumors. Um, he just didn't know who this Galilean preacher was. And so when Jesus responds, he responds in such a way that he doesn't incriminate himself. What would his, what, if he would have said, yes, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, I am. Then he would have automatically been guilty and executed. If he said no, he wouldn't be telling the truth. So Jesus couches it in a way that Pilate has to make a decision based on some kind of faith. So when he says, is that your own idea? Did others talk to you about me? He's not hedging. He's not dodging. He's forcing Pilate to come to his own conclusion. And of course, Pilate responds, I'm not a Jew. I don't know your, who you are or your position, why the Jews, Jewish leadership has put you in front of me. I don't know any of that stuff. So what is it you've done? And then Jesus goes on and says something very significant. My kingdom is not of this world. And that little preposition of is, is just a very simple little Greek preposition that has a range of meanings. It can mean from or it can mean of. And, and I want to take in that whole range of meanings because what Jesus is telling him is that his kingdom is not of the same origin it's not worldly, it's not earthly, it's heavenly, it's divine. But he's also talking about its nature. It's not based on the same political principles that kings and governors and high priests and priests base theirs on. It's not based on power. It's not based on wealth. It's based on the things Jesus had taught. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. He who seeks to reign, to rule over people, must be their servant. It's the upside-down kingdom. So its nature is different, and its origin is different. And so Jesus, I think, is trying to make that again, give Pilate a glimpse uh, of what he's talking about, that he's a totally different, he's a king, certainly, but because he has a kingdom, but it's a totally different kind of kingdom. 
If it were the kind of kingdom that people like Pilate understood, his servants would have fought in the garden to not have them turned over to the Jews. But it's not a kingdom that, that is, wins victories by the sword. It's a totally different kind of kingdom. And again, he says, but now my kingdom is from another place. It's got a different origin, and it has a different nature. And so I think the NIV tries to pick that up. It's not of this world by nature. It's not from this world by origin. It's a different kind of kingdom that we live in. But Pilate just hears that one thing. Oh, you've got a kingdom. You must be a king then. So you are a king, he says in verse 37. And Jesus answers, you are right in saying that I am a king. Again, not saying yes, but saying you are right in saying that leaving Pilate to have to make a choice. And then he says, In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Is that what kings or other political leaders are most committed to, is telling the truth? That's why it's so hard for a Christian to be in politics, at any level. Because politics, whether you are a, a, a an appointee of Caesar, or whether you are elected by people in a representative democracy, the principles of politics continue to work no matter what your motivation, no matter how pure of heart you are. It's difficult because all of politics is about being self-serving and getting everything you can out of it. And I'm afraid sometimes that we have an ideal view of politics, that somehow politicians are supposed to be above corruption. But the reality is, is politics is always corrupt by its nature because it's self-serving. Because it's about taking power to yourself. It's about using that power to create wealth, usually for yourself and your friends. And so we shouldn't be surprised when that happens, no matter what the political identity, no matter what the political affiliations. um, Oh, I can't remember his name now, but he said that great thing I heard first from Chuck Colson. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's absolutely true. And it was true of Pilate. And it's true of of all who who would get into that arena. And it's a great lesson, because the kingdom that we're part of isn't about those things. It's a spiritual kingdom. And it's about truth. And it's about understanding who Jesus is. That's what Pilate was trying to figure out. But he wasn't getting there because when Jesus says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me, Pilate responds, what is truth? Now, the really sad thing is, is that we don't know the tone of Pilate's voice when he asked that. We don't know whether he was being sincere and authentic and asking a question, which it very well could have been. Matter of fact, biblical preachers and commentators from the first few hundred years of the church assume that, that, that Pilate was asking a legitimate, authentic question. What is truth? But I think as a reflection, most modern commentators in our skeptical scientific age see it more as a cynical thing of, oh, what is truth? As if there can be no thing. And it's hard to know. Matter of fact, it's impossible to know for sure. But what it does is it reinforces that idea that that politics and truth don't go together. They simply are not in the same sphere. It's not about truth. It's about pragmatism. And that's what Pilate was. Pilate was the ultimate pragmatist. He wanted to keep his job. He wanted to keep his career. He was a careerist. And he was willing to, to make any compromise, to make any political partnership to see that he could keep his position in the government. And so he was the ultimate pragmatist. And again, we have lots of pragmatists still in government who will say or do anything to get elected or reelected and change their mind and, as media sometimes calls it, waffles on everything. If you pay any attention to the news, you see it all the time. We don't need to bring out examples because I don't want to offend any of you who are Democrats or Republicans, because it happens on both sides. The people will say and compromise anything to retain their power. And we are so surprised when that kind of corruption happens. But it happens for Jesus in this place at this time. So they have this conversation, and Pilate, again, tries to get Jesus freed. 
But they don't want Jesus, they want Barabbas, who was, in our terminology, a terrorist. He was a terrorist, Barabbas was, who had tried to take part in a rebellion that would overthrow Pilate and the Roman government of that time. So, Pilate, seeing that he's doing no good, has Jesus flogged in the first three verses of chapter 19. The crown of thorns, the mockery, and again, it's not personal. These soldiers don't know who Jesus is. They've just been told by Pilate, go abuse him a little bit, like you would with any other rebel. rebel. And it's interesting. Somebody pointed out that the description that John gives is pretty straightforward without much detail, unlike Mel Gibson did in portraying Jesus in The Passion of the Cross. You don't find all the blood and gore um, that is that. It's a very straightforward description of what they did to him. And so Jesus is tortured, in essence, mocked, struck. And then the second act of these next three scenes, again, there's a conversation in the middle of it. The Jews keep insisting that Jesus must die, and not only die according to their law, which if they could enforce, it would have been by stoning. But it wasn't. They wanted him crucified to hang on a tree because what did the Old Testament say? Everyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Jesus would be cursed. He would be forgotten because because the Messiah couldn't be someone that hung on a tree. And so they want him to be crucified the Roman way, not stoned the Jewish way. And that's why they are so insistent that, that the Romans take care of Jesus in their way. And so... When Jesus and Pilate again talk, Jesus, after his suffering, doesn't answer Pilate, and who knows? He's been up all night. He's been beaten and struck and mocked, and he's tired. And at some point, he knows what's going to happen, and it's so like, I think it's like, what's the point? What's the point in arguing? And so he doesn't respond to Pilate at this time directly. But then when Pilate says something in verse 10 that he has to respond to, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And that's when Jesus says something that should just cause us to pause and to ponder and to realize the truth in whatever situation we find ourselves in. Jesus replies, you would have no power over me if if it were not given to you from above. Paul explicates this in Romans chapter 13. There's no government in place that God has not appointed and superintends over. And I think that's a really difficult thing for us to grasp. We believe that we elect presidents. Well, on, on, on one level we do, but in essence we don't. God is always behind the scenes. He causes kingdoms to rise and kingdoms to fall. He causes kings to be put in place and kings to fall. He allows dictators to come onto the scene. He allowed the United States to come and create a Republican, a Democratic Republic. All of that stuff is in God's hands, ultimately. And you know what? If God can be in charge of governments that rise and fall and civilizations that come and go, he has us in his hands as well. He oversees and superintends our lives. And just as Jesus entrusted himself to his father and knew that Pilate did not have that power unless his father gave it to him, we can trust God in the same way, that he has our interests in mind, just as he had the interests of the whole world in mind when he allowed Jesus to go to the cross. And he will take care of us. And you know what? Paul, again, reflects this truth. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. It was about this time last year that I had that first notification, first knowledge that I had lymphoma, that I had a cancer. And um, I really made that public at Easter sunrise service. And my bottom line in announcing it, I found out was taken all over the valley by people who knew people. You know this information age, you can't keep anything quiet, right? It went far beyond the borders of Weezer, but it was this. For me, there are no bad outcomes. 
And isn't that the truth that we need to grasp onto and hold? For each of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ, there are no bad outcomes. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Jesus knew that. And so therefore he was willing to call Pilate's delusion, his self-delusion, that somehow he was in control of Jesus. Because he wasn't. He may have thought he had the power to free and power to crucify, but he didn't. Because God was behind it all. <clears throat> and then finally, the judicial reality, beyond Pilate's political reality, that Jesus says this, Therefore, the one, and it could even be interpreted, it could even be translated, the entity, the entity who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And I believe my friend Mark is trying to make the point in all of what we talked about is it wasn't the Jewish people as a whole that crucified Jesus. It was Annas' family and his extended family and the power behind that family to be priests for the people, to represent the people. They are the ones I believe that Jesus is pointing for, towards. It's Annas and his family who handed me over to you and they are great, guilty of the greater sin. And so... When you go on from there, it puts the lie to all the anti-Semitism that's been part of our history, not only as people, but as the church. To, to, to blame the Jewish people for the death of Jesus is patently wrong. Because it wasn't the Jewish people as a whole, it was Annas' political machinations that caused Jesus to go to Pilate and to be crucified. And so Roman power, hand in hand with Jewish power, is what put Jesus on the cross. And we talked last week about Peter's betrayal of Jesus. The Jews do far worse, and we don't even notice it. But when, they, when we get to the end of this section, when Pilate asks in verse 15, shall I crucify your king? What do they reply? We have no king but Caesar. That is the ultimate betrayal. Because if they were honest, they could, they could only say, we have no king but God. And when they said, we have no king but Caesar, they were betraying the very core of their beliefs in the one God who is the king of the world, the creator of the world, the only one to whom loyalty is due. And they sealed their fate, I believe, at that very point, when they said, we have no king but Caesar. But what were they doing? They were making sure that Pilate knew that he was between that rock and that hard spot. They were making sure that he knew that the agreement they had politically to be political partners had to be enforced, it had to be followed up on. And they had to get their way because they could send another delegation to Caesar and they could get Pilate essentially fired, if not executed. So Pilate the pragmatist responds and hands Jesus over to the soldiers to be crucified. I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind um, because we don't have that issue around here so much of anti-Semitism, but we still have prejudice. And the truth is that we are all the same at the foot of the cross. There's nobody that's different. There's nobody that is any less or more a sinner than I am. And we always need to keep that in mind. Hand in hand with the reality that God is in control. That God ultimately is causing the things to happen that he wants to happen to complete his plan of growing us up in Christ. Just as with Jesus, he wanted Jesus to go to the cross to provide salvation for the whole world. Remember Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Being lifted up was obviously referring to the cross and to that kind of death. And so God wants that for the world. He so loved the world that he sent his only son to die. That was all part of the plan. All the figures in here are working under that plan. But it doesn't make them unresponsible or irresponsible or not responsible. Because Pilate choose, chose to act on pragmatism instead of the truth. The truth was before him and he rejected it. For the Jewish leaders, for Annas' family, Jesus was the Messiah. And they couldn't stand for that to be true. So they coerced, they manipulated, they did whatever they could to make sure that Jesus died. 
as we continue to worship, let's just again come with humility. Come with that reality. Let's pray. Lord, we do just come and we just want to again voice the truth that you are ultimately in control of this world. The kingdoms come and go, kings rise and fall, and none of it, ha- none of it escapes your plan because it's all part of your plan. And Lord, we know that how it ends because you've given us your word. We know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And the total opposite of what happened in this story is going to happen. The mockery of Jesus will turn into the worship of Jesus by everyone. And so, Lord, help us to grasp that truth and live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.